All right. Welcome 624ers to the video lectures on chapters four and five. So um, nearly every text, text, textbook on the face of the earth uh, does some sort of similar arrangement as this one. So we have a chapter that discusses gross income, its definition and inclusions, and then a chapter that discusses exclusions. And um, comes to no surprise, this one's no different. So these two chapters do walk hand in hand. They walk together. So they, even though it's a lot of reading, I get it. Um, they just need to go together because it makes sense. And chapter four, what we're going to find isn't too bad, even though, you know, we highlight some of these inclusions. Typically what happens is we look at things that maybe intuitively you didn't think were income and demonstrate how they are income. And then, of course, conclude with, yeah, that's why they're in taxable income or gross income. Okay, that's it. Let's get going. All right. So what is gross income? Right. So first, there needs to be some economic benefit. So these are the tax rules. There's, there's, the book spends a bunch of time on like financial accounting rules and economic rules, whatever. Uh, I think that is foundationally important to get to this point. But um for a bunch of graduate students, I'm hoping you have a basic understanding of some of those elements. So, for example, is the receipt of a loan income, right? And that's especially true if it's from the bank. Why? Well, the bank certainly has an expectation of you paying that money back. So you don't you haven't received an economic benefit. Um, whereas if your mom loans you the money, does she really expect to be repaid? Probably depends on who your mom is and, and who you are, for that matter. Uh, but you can see where there, there might be some mild, modest differences between whether one of those is a bona fide debt and one of them is not. Uh, of course, the bank being a bona fide debt. So if you don't have the economic or if you do have the economic benefit, then the next uh, thing to consider is whether there's been a realization event. And a realization event is when a transaction is complete and income can be measured objectively. So, uh, for example, when you engage in a transaction with another party, and in particular, that's more likely to be a third party, not a related party. And that transaction results in measurable change in property rights. So, for example, if I sell something, that's a realization event because I sold it. I no longer own it. Someone else uh, takes ownership of that property. Uh, and the same is true in a way when you, you know, work. Uh, you provide services, and at some point they pay you for those services, they generally pay you in cash. And by receiving that money, uh, there's been a change in property rights. It was their cash, now it's your cash. Congratulations. And then the last part is recognition, right? And almost all income that's realized is recognized, um, but there are some deferral and exclusion provisions. And as I mentioned at the start of this, uh, we'll cover those. And exclude means you never recognize it, right? It's just flat out excluded. And deferred means, well, you're not going to recognize it now. We're going to recognize it at some point in the future. Both of those are generally pretty valuable. Okay, so gross income can take basically any form, right? Cash is a pretty common form, right? What we think about being paid uh, or salaries and wages and things like that. But you can be paid in, in property like stocks, bonds, cars, planes. All those things are still forms of income. And you can even be paid in services, right? So, hey, I'll, I'll uh, do your taxes if you fix my car, right? Barter transactions are income transactions as well. And so uh, you, you can't skirt recognizing income because someone pays you in uh, using, you know, some form of property or services that's harder to trace, perhaps, but still income. All right. So Mark's a lawyer and his clients make the following payments to him for services rendered. So they give him a thousand bucks cash. That's definitely income. A check for a thousand dollars. Also, generally speaking, you think of that as being income. A credit card charge for $1,000, still income. A gift card worth $1,000, sure, still income. Chickens worth $1,000? Yeah, even chickens worth $1,000 would still be income. And car repairs, right, as we described. But how about a promise to pay him $1,000 next month? And I, I want to make a distinction between that and a check. Right. A check is a 
commonly used negotiable instrument that we use and that, well, we use less of these days, but is still used, especially business to business, um, that represents a, a, a legal obligation, if you will, to pay versus a promise to pay, hey, I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. Um, that doesn't really carry the same sort of weight. And it's important to recognize that, especially when we get into the accounting for uh, income and the constructive receipt rules. Okay, so when, and son of a gun, here we are. Uh, when there are two basic methods uh, for accounting for tax purposes, the cash method and the accrual method, and the cash method for income uh, hinges almost exclusively on this concept of constructive receipt. And we need to notice that constructive receipt is not the same as actual receipt. Uh, constructive receipt can occur before actual receipt. So income, though not actually reduced to a taxpayer's possession, right? So not actually received, is constructively received in the taxable year in which it is credited to their accounts, set apart for them, or otherwise made available so that they could draw upon it at any time, or so that they could have drawn upon it during the taxable year if notice of intention to withdraw had been given. So if it's in your account, you control it, right? Uh, if it's available so that you could draw upon it if you wanted to, you're in control. If you can give notice and then they have to give it to you, you're in control. And so all these ideas are, hey, you may not actually have it, but you basically have control of it. And the constructive receipt rule in summary form is kind of like you just can't turn your back on the income, right? If you're in control of it, you can't turn your back on it. And, and there, therefore, it's going to be income unless there's some sort of substantial limitation or restriction on your access to that money. So who can use the cash method? Just about everyone except the C-Corp and a partnership with a C-Corp as a partner, but there are exceptions. Uh, farming, it doesn't matter how you're organized. Qualified personal service corps can use the cash method. And since 2018, uh, if you're defined as a small business and a small business is any entity over the previous three years who has gross receipts that for 2022 don't exceed 27 million. So when they pass the law, it's 25, but it gets inflation adjusted every year. And it's up to 27 million. So a fairly good sized company. That's gross receipts. It's not income. Um, so that means, you know, your total revenue would need to be less than 27 million um, for the three year period ending. So that's, that's pretty big. So accrual based taxpayers uh, recognize income under a different set of rules. The set of rules are called the all events test. And the all events test says uh, if all the events have occurred, which fix the right to receive the income and the amount can be determined with reasonable accuracy, then it is income, period. Right. So the all events test is a, is a court case, a uh, Supreme Court case that came along out of Schlude. And uh, what Schlude did is define what does it mean to have fixed the right to receive income? And the court said, well, that happens when the income is earned, right? So that means it's never later than you recognize it for books. Uh, and that really covers most transactions, right? Most of the time, um, accrual-based taxpayers, when they earn the income, you're going to recognize it for the all events test as well. But it also says when payment is due or payment is received. And where that goes astray is, you know, we're, we're used to gap accounting and gap accounting says, if you receive a payment, but you haven't earned it, that's unearned income. That's actually a liability. But uh, the all events test doesn't agree with that. So you buy a Cheesecake Factory gift card for your friend uh, back in the holidays in 2020. Your friend holds on to it. Uh, for two years, uh, largely because he it took him that long to get through the menu. So it's 2022. He rolls in the Cheesecake Factory and, and pays with the gift card that you gave him. 
So let's think about what the book accounting is for this, for Cheesecake Factory, right? That's who we're concerned with here is Cheesecake Factory. So in 2020, they debit cashed and they credit unearned revenue, right? Waiting for that gift card to be uh, submitted and then, and then used by the customer. Nothing happens in 2021 because there's no exchange, right? They're just holding on to the gift card. It doesn't expire because gift cards like that, especially in California, they, they have no expiration. And then in 2022, when the gift card's presented, they finally earn the revenue. And they'd also, you know, recognize their cost of goods sold at that same time as well. We're not really focused on the cost side so much at this moment. We're focused on the income side, but that is what would happen. However, under the all events test, in 2020, remember, it's the earlier of, and they've received the cash. And so under the all events test, technically, they're going to go ahead and credit revenue in 2020. In 2021, they'd also do nothing. And then in 2022, when the gift card is presented, sorry, you guys, when it's presented, um, that's when you'd recognize cost of goods sold in inventory. But this results in terrible matching. And so the the... The Cheesecake Factory, you know, in a way, wait a second, I got to slide out of order, sorry. There we go, words and all. All right. So fortunately, Congress came along and said, well, before Congress, even the IRS, they had issued some revenue procedures because everyone recognized how crazy that rule was. Um, and so there's there's a, a new code section that, that was, this was also passed starting in 2018 that took those revenue procedures and captured it and actually made it a little more uh, easy to understand. So 451C is the code section. It basically says, hey, you know what? It, when you're in that situation where someone pays you an advance payment for goods or services, we're going to let you defer it, but never for more than one year, right? So never for more than one year. And uh, if you recognize it for financial statement purposes, then you have to recognize it for tax purposes. So I don't, I don't care what the all events test says. I don't care if you've recognized it for financial statements, you have to recognize it for tax as well. Uh, but we'll always let you recognize it under the all events test if you'd prefer, right? If you want to recognize it right away, uh, the government always loves collecting your tax money sooner. And so you can always do that. So now we're at the right slide. So what would Cheesecake do under, you know, the new 451C rules? They'd say, well, look, I don't have to recognize gift card in 2020. That's the year of the sale. That's the year they got the advance payment. However, since you can only defer up until the end of the following tax year, they would be required to recognize that income in 2021. So it's still mismatched, right? Because the cost of goods sold isn't going to flow through still until 2022, but it's better, right? It's better. All right. Other exceptions from the all events test. So prepaid interest. There's no deferral on prepaid interest. When you receive it, it is income to you, period. Same with prepaid rent, right? So if someone prepays you rent, it is income when received. And the example uh, that we normally think about is when you sign a new lease, you often have to pay first and last month's rent up front. And your landlord has to, to recognize if they're on the accrual basis, if, frankly, if they're on the cash basis, they do too. Um, they have to go ahead and recognize that those two months of rent as income because uh, prepaid rent is always recognized when received. Okay, so uh, from a types of income perspective, you know, obviously there are there are tons of different kinds of income. Um, but and remember, this chapter is kind of just saying, hey, you know, gross income is kind of everything under the sun. We talked about that back in in chapter three. Uh, so let me point out some things that are that are obvious choices to be income, and then some less obvious choices. And of course, you know, income compensation from providing personal services, that's a pretty obvious gross income. Uh, anyone who's worked knows that the wages you receive are income. Uh, your child's earned income belongs to the child. So that's kind of a strange thing. You know, if, if you have like a seven-year-old, uh, you know, who's an actor or movie star and they make a lot of money, that income belongs to them. Even if in the state you live, um, 
their the parents have control over the money. It doesn't matter. And that's something called the assignment of income doctrine. And it really says that income is recognized by the individual that earned it or that held the property that earned it. Uh, because in the past, what taxpayers have done, no surprise, is they try to assign income, especially to inter family members to say, oh, no, it's not my income. It's my seven year old's income. Right. That's the whole reason behind the kitty tax. That whole thing exists because it's an attempt to defeat assignment of income. Uh, and so the assignment of income doctrine basically says, hey, if you earned it, it's yours. If you own the property, whatever income the property generates is also yours. So, you know, since we're talking about compensation, uh, you know, I, I, there's all these crazy rules around compensation and we do have to learn them. But uh, I, want, I want you to gain a basic understanding of like pragmatically how this process works. So I'm an employee. I work for the state of California. And uh, as, as part of my you know, role as an employee, I get a monthly paycheck. They pay us monthly in the Cal State system. And so uh, these numbers are fairly accurate, but they're, they're not this year's numbers. So gross. And by the way, every if you're curious, the Sacramento Bee publishes uh, the salaries of every single uh, state employee, including, you know, every professor you have at San Diego State University. So it's all you know public knowledge anyway. So uh, salary, 12,000. They take money out for parking. Uh, there's a $500 contribution to a 457 plan, which maybe some of you know what it is, but it's kind of like a retirement plan, a 42 contribution, $42 contribution to a medical flexible spending account or an FSA, $574 goes to my pension plan. I contribute, uh, to that, not voluntarily, but it, it's okay. It's saving for my retirement as well. I pay $12 to be a member of the faculty staff club on campus. I pay $1,200 is withheld for income tax, $490 for state income tax, and $918 for employment taxes. And the state, on top of that, the state, that, so that's all what's taken out of my check. On top of that, the state pays about $1,500 a month for my medical insurance for me and my, my household, about $169 a month for my dental insurance. $7.50 for my vision insurance, $5 for long-term disability, uh, $7.50 for group term life insurance, up to $50,000, and uh, a $3,500 contribution to the qualified pension plan. So, you know, there's all this, all this, these items, all these transactions going on inside my employee pay. And some of them are taxable, some of them are not taxable. Thankfully, employers are liable, if you will, they are responsible to create an accurate form W-2 to report the amount of taxable wages to their employees every year. And they have to send it to them by uh, January 31st. So, you know, this box one up here, this is not my box one, man, I wish it were. Uh, but that box one, that represents all the taxable wages. And typically what happens is you just take that amount and you just report it right on um, your 1040, right? So you just take that number and report it. If there's, you know, if there's more of you, you take multiple W-2s, you add them together and I'll put them there. So, you know, the, the good news is what this means is that really the burden of determining capital, uh, capital, taxable, I think I got thrown because it says table, table compensation, don't know what that is, I guess that's if you work at Ikea, uh, but taxable compensation falls on the employer, not on the employee. Now, it's still your responsibility, right? If your employer does something wrong, that does not, um, that does not protect you from owing the tax. It might protect you from owing penalties and interest, but you're still going to owe the tax, just because someone reported something wrong on your W-2 um, doesn't mean that you get to dodge the tax that's associated with it. So um, you can see that, you know, payroll tax specialist is a pretty cool job, right? And, and even though we don't spend a lot of time on that, though we are going to spend some time on it, um, that's a cool outcome from being a tax person is to decide you want to go into the payroll tax area. And it has its own credentials and everything. And, and frankly, the exams are pretty hard. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good credential to have uh, if you want to work payroll. 
you know, one of the downsides is a lot, a lot, a lot of companies just outsource their payroll to like ADP or one of the payroll processors. And so, you know, you, you might end up working for them, but most of that's done within their IT systems on their side. Okay, so that's income from, from services. The other thing you can get is income from property you own. And again, kind of under the assignment of income doctrine, if you own the property, you generally are going to own the income too. Um, and recognition for interest. This is, a, this is a fun little quirk in the system. And I, I know, you know, probably some of you are, you, you had your bonds in your intermediate accounting, but you've forgotten it. And some of you may have not had bonds yet in intermediate accounting, but the recognition of interest follows time and not payment. So $10,000 bond purchased at issuance on 1121. The rate is 5%. It pays uh, interest every six months. So, you know, at 5%, what would happen is you'd expect it to pay uh, $250 every six months. And usually those occur on, you know, every six months. So like June 30th, December 31st, June 30th, December 31st. And it would do that for the life of the bond. But see, people buy and sell bonds all the time, right? So if the bond is sold and settled on February 28th, there's 59 days of interest that's not going to be paid for the person who owned it for 59 interest. The bond uh, company, you know, the creditor is going to pay, sorry, the debtor is going to pay the owner that owns it on the interest payment date, which is going to be June 30th. So what happens is you're required to accrue interest up to that sale date. And when the buyer is going to buy the bond, they have to pay for that accrued interest at the same time. So imagine, if you will, the bond is worth exactly 100000 on February 28th. Well, the buyer would need to pay $10,080.82 because they need to pay them for the interest that's accrued to date. And then what happens is when they receive the total payment, of what I say, $250, um, they actually get to deduct the $80.82 that they paid to someone else. That, that's how you reflect the appropriate amount of interest income that you as the second holder, if you will, of that bond actually earned. So this particular bond was issued at par. So that means it's issued at its face value, right? So that means uh, I give them $10,000, they give me a piece of paper, that says, I'm gonna pay you 5% for X number of years. Let's just say 10, why not? So for 10 years, and then at the end of 10 years, I'm gonna give you your $10,000 back. But what happens when rates for similar bonds decrease to 4%? So I'm holding a 5% bond in a world that's issuing 4% bonds because prevailing interest rates change all the time. So would you rather have a bond that pays 4 or 5%? Well, almost everyone would rather have a bond that pays 5%. And since I own it, I get to command a premium, right? Because since prevailing rate is 4%, I'm going to make you pay me more for that because I've got it at 5 And if you want it from me, you're going to have to pay me enough to make it worth my while to get rid of it. Because if I take the money you give me and reinvest in bonds, I'm only going to get 4%. So I'm going to price it at an amount higher than its face value. I'm going to price it at $11,025. Why? Well, this is paying 5% in a 4% world. Now, in this case, the sales price would be the $11,025. Again, plus the accrued interest, right? I still have to pay or receive, depending on whether I'm the buyer or the seller. It creates it. And so what, what we call that, that amount is market premium, right? And market premium means that the, the interest rate market has changed. And so that bond is at a premium. And of course, the interest rate market can change the other direction, right? Interest rates could have increased to 6%. Well, now I'm holding a 5% bond in a 6% world. Well, no one's going to want to buy my bond unless I reduce its price. That's called market discount. And we're not going to spend a ton of time uh, because the computations for market discount and market premium are fairly difficult, but I am going to give you a homework problem on it. So be ready. So what happens is it makes this sale far more complex, right? So someone's going to pay me, let's say I'm the owner, $11,105.82. What is that for? Well, 
10,000 of that I get back tax free because that's my basis in the bond. That's what I paid for the bond was 10,000. That remaining amount, 1105.82, well, I know $80.82 is uh, the fact that I need to be compensated for my 59 days worth of interest income since it's been 59 days since it last paid any interest. And then anything that's residual is legitimate capital gain, right? That's legitimate capital gain. Okay. So how about stock? So, right. These are the two big investment vehicles. I mean, and then there's, of course, everything in between, but you either own bo uh, bonds or stocks. So how does a stockholder receive income from a corporation? So, for example, how is income allocated to shareholders? So let's take uh, year end uh, 12, 21. The McDonald's generated seven and a half billion dollars in net income. So earnings per share was about seven or eight dollars per share for McDonald's in 2021. It was a good year. Uh, kind of a lot of years are good years for McDonald's. So I own 22 shares of McDonald's, which I do. What is my share of income and how do I report it? Well, corporations are not flow through entities, right? So shareholders and corporations will generally only recognize income when it is distributed to them not through some sort of allocation system. So McDonald's paid dividends of a $1.29 uh, you know, for its owners on the first three quarters, and then they increased their dividend for the last quarter to $1.38. That's going to be my income, right? I'm going to recognize that dividend income because it was distributed to me. Now, remember, McDonald's has already paid income taxes on its earnings, Right. So and if you looked at their financial statements, you'd see their tax expense was one and a half billion. Just to be clear, that's not exactly what they paid. If you know your deferred taxes from intermediate, you know that the tax expense on the financial statements is a combination of both current and deferred. Um, and so that that's may or may not be what they paid, but that's the expense they recognized. So let's think about this situation where I get a corporate distribution, right? So let's start with the no preferred rate column. So in this case, the corporation makes $100. It pays tax of 21% or $21. So that means the money that's left over for the owners, right, for dividends is $79. And let's just assume everyone's in the highest tax bracket, uh, which is a pretty common thing where we think about investors. Uh, and so the tax rate for them is 37%. That would mean the dividend tax would be $29. Total taxes, the corporate share and the individual share, the owner's share, would be $50. And that drives the effective tax rate up to 50%. This is why you see that we have a preferential rate for dividends. So if we go to the second column, the preferential rate can actually be 0, 15, or 20, and it depends on your income. So let's start in the 15% one, just so we can see the mechanics. So again, profit of 100, $21 worth of corporate taxes, 79 left over. All of it is distributed to the owners. They only pay tax of 15%. That means the dividend tax is only $12. Total taxes are 33, and you can see that that drives that down. Uh, it drives the rate down to 33% from 50%. And in the last one where they said, hey, pretty much the, the numbers don't tie out exactly. They used to, but uh, Tax Cuts and Job Act, they, they screwed up and accidentally didn't tie the two amounts together. But in any event, you're supposed to kick into the 20% dividend bracket when you are in the highest earner income bracket for ordinary income. So uh, same corporate $100, same corporate taxes at $21, end up with 79 bucks. If it's distributed and taxed at 20%, look at that, total taxes are 37%. So what happens is by lowering the dividend tax rate, you're collecting not a double tax, or I should say less of a double tax. Right. So if if I collect 20 percent on dividends, what's really happening is the total tax on that income is only 37 percent. OK, so in order to get the preferential rates, these uh, qualified dividend rates, uh, you have to hold the stock for a certain number of days. Uh, we're not going to get into too much detail on that. But here's what a 1099 dividend looks like. This is I probably just plucked this off the Internet somewhere. 
Uh, and you can see it's got, you know, total ordinary dividends, uh, and then it's got qualified dividends. And again, qualified dividends are the ones that are, are eligible for the preferential rate treatment. Total capital gain distribution, we'll get there eventually when we do capital gains, there's a little tax withheld, et cetera. Okay, so that's the corporate side. How about other investments in property? So for example, what if I invest in a non-corporate business entity, like a partnership, an LLC, which can elect under the check the box rules to be a partnership, or a trust or an estate? We generally all, we consider all of these uh, to be flow-through entities. And so what that means is income is allocated to the owners when it's recognized by the business and distribution is not required. So this is almost the exact opposite of the corporate form. Remember, a corporation doesn't allocate its income to the owners, um, but it does when a distribution is made. A flow through generally allocates the income to the owners, but does not include distributions as taxable income. That's the general rules. So if McDonald's was a partnership, my share would be 22 shares out of 750 million or point blah, 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 two, nine. So if their income was seven and a half billion, my share of income would be $220. And that would be true whether McDonald's paid me a single penny in dividends because it'd be based on allocations. Fortunately, McDonald's not a partnership, so I'm all set. Okay, so another weird thing about gross income, because remember what we're doing, we're working our way through this chapter that really starts with gross income is everything. And let me point out a few things that are weird about gross income, right? So dividends get a different rate, they can be qualified uh, or non-qualified. Well, here's another one, right? And this is when you earn income in a state that's a community property state like California. And it, and it's a very narrow set of rules, meaning it doesn't apply to very many taxpayers. But because we live in California, I think it's important we learn about it. So California is a community property state. What that means is uh, income is divided differently in a community property state. So since most married couples file jointly, that doesn't matter. It really only matters if you file separately. So in a community property state, there are two types of property. There's either community property or there's separate property. And in California, separate property is property that was owned prior to the marriage or was inherited during the marriage. And pretty much all other property that's owned by either or both of the spouses is community property. So A and B are married. A has wages of 40,000 and B has wages of 50,000. They also have a joint savings account of $200. And A has an investment that she owned prior to marriage that generated $400 of income. So assuming the, uh, the California uh, community property rules apply, what happens is you allocate each of these things e evenly to the extent they're community property. So A's wages of 40,000, half belong to A, half belong to B. B's wages of 50,000, half belong to A, half belong to B. That's unlike common law. The common law state rules would say, hey, you generated the income, it's yours. So A would have 40 and B would have 50. But you can see instead, they add them together and split them evenly. Same with the $200 of interest income from their joint account. However, that investment that was owned prior to marriage, that's considered separate property. And since A owned it, it all goes to A. So how about the other direction, right? How about when, when a uh, married couple gets divorced? So typically step one is you divide all the existing property between the two spouses. So it's kind of like the, hey, you get the house and the car, I get the dog and kids, right? This is merely a division of property, and as a result, it doesn't trigger tax. There's no tax when you divide up your property when you get divorced, right? So, and it doesn't matter if the basis in the property is really low and it's got a bunch of value today. There's no tax recognition on the division of property. So step two is, are there any support payments? Because there's really two kinds of support payments, alimony and all other. Right. So alimony is a payment to your ex-spouse uh, and it's kind of defined as 
a payment for the income they lost because they were, you know, being your spouse. So for divorces that are prior to 2019, alimony is income. And it also is deductible. It's a deduction for AGI from the spouse that's paying it. However, starting in 2019, alimony is no longer income and it is no longer deductible. And anything, any support payments that are not alimony, those have never been income or deductible. And those rules are just consistent. So child support, for example, not income, not deductible. Okay, the next weird thing, and this is a weird one, is called imputed interest. And it's an, it's a, it's a, it's funny, I, you know, I describe it as an outcome that's based in economics, but it can be hard to follow. Um, that's true. And then what happens is we layer in some tax exceptions that make it more complicated probably than it should be. So let's start with the economics. If I loan you $100,000 for 10 years and you have use of that money, well, that means I do not have use of that money. So when I loan someone money, I expect to be rewarded for the loss of being able to use my money. And we're going to call that interest. And as a result, I should charge you some prevailing rate of interest, right? I loan you $100,000. My expectation is you're going to pay me 5% every year. And then at the end, you'll give me back my $100,000. But what if I charge you 0%? What if I loan you the money and you say, look, in five years, pay me back, right? No interest, 0% interest. Well, you clearly benefit by being able to use my money and you don't have to pay for it, right? Because you're paying 0% interest. So I have transferred something of value to you, right? And anytime that happens, there's a pretty good chance there's going to be income recognition, right? And that's why Congress says there's no such thing as a free lunch. The, the rules say, hey, you know what? There is interest. It's just not stated. It's imputed. And lenders, right? The person that loans the money has to recognize imputed interest income. Borrows, borrowers will have interest expense, but it may not be deductible. And so what rate are you supposed to use? If, I, if my rate's too low, then what rate is the right rate? Well, the IRS publishes tables every month that list what are called the applicable federal rates. Okay, so I loan my sister $100,000 for 10 years at 0% because I, I want her to be able to buy a house and she's my sister and, you know, I love her. And so why wouldn't I treat her nicely? At the time, the applicable federal rates do a half percent. So under the imputed interest rules, I'm required to recognize that two and a half percent of interest. So I recognize $2,500 worth of interest income, even though I received nothing. And then I will be treated as simultaneously having gifted back to my sister that same $2,500, right? Since I don't have it, something needed to happen. I needed the second side of that journal entry, if you will. So what about her? Well, she'll have interest expense of $2,500. And since it's on her house, it could be deductible. And we'll get to itemized deductions eventually. Um, but if it's not, if it's not for a business or an itemized interest deduction, it's generally not deductible. Uh, and she's also treated as having received a $2,500 gift, but recall the gifts are not taxable. And if you don't recall that, we're going to get to it in chapter five. All right. So what if I loan my employee? What if I'm a corporation and I loan my employee a hundred thousand dollars for 10 years at 1% so she can pay for her kid's college? And this is at a time where the applicable federal rate is two and a half percent. Well, I'm going to have to recognize interest income of 1500, right? That's the difference between what I'm charging and the applicable federal rate. That's the one and a half percent times the hundred thousand dollars. And simultaneously, I'll be treated as having paid my employee fifteen hundred dollars in compensation, right? Because remember, it's much more difficult. Well, actually, again, this is more chapter five stuff. It amazes me. They construct these chapters backward. But, um, you know, pretty much any transfer of value from an employer to an employee tends to be compensation and is taxable. OK, so uh, what about my employee? Well, she'll have interest expense of fifteen hundred since she used it for college. That's a non deductible form of interest. And she will have treated have as having received 1500 in compensation and that should be reflected as we know now on her w-2 right the payroll tax people need to know that to make sure they include it on her w-2 
All right. So what if I'm a corporation and I loan my shareholder $100,000 at 1%? The applicable federal rate is 2.5%. Well, again, we get the same kind of thing on the, the uh, corporation side, on the, the creditor side. They'd have to recognize interest income of 1500 That's the spread between the two times the 100000 And they will be treated as simultaneously having paid the shareholder 1500 in dividends, right? Because the shareholder doesn't necessarily get uh, wages, but they do get compensation through dividends, and so you would treat that as a dividend. Uh, the shareholder would have interest expense, probably not deductible because it was used for college, and also treated as having received a $1,500 dividend. Okay, but what if I loan my sister 500 bucks and she's going to pay me back at her next paycheck in about two weeks? Do I really need to go through the hassle of imputing interest? And that, there's the you know, recognition on the part of Congress. No, that's crazy. So let's create some exceptions. So the first is if it's a gift loan of 10000 or less, um, then it's you don't need to worry about imputing interest on it. Unless the person you loan it to goes out and buys income producing property, then we got a problem. If the gift loan is between... Uh, Individuals, sorry, if a gift loan between individuals is less than 100000 the imputed interest is limited to the amount of nest investment income. So if net investment income is $1,000 or less, there would actually be no imputed interest on this regardless, right? So you only have to pick up the amount in excess of the net investment income. So there are other exceptions. Uh, compensation and shareholder related loans of $10,000 or less are excluded from the imputed interest rules unless you can determine that they were motivated by tax avoidance. That burden of proof would generally fall on the IRS. All right, we're almost done. Let's get through these last few sections. And then we got to do chapter five, right? Okay, so uh, annuities. So what is an annuity? Well, here's the investor.gov, uh, so the U.S. government's definition. An annuity is a contract between you and an insurance company. It doesn't have to be an insurance company, but it is almost exclusively insurance companies. That requires the insurer to make payments to you either immediately or in the future. You buy an annuity by making either a single payment or a series of payments. Similarly, your payout may come as either one lump sum or as a series of payments over time. And the, the one we're most concerned with is the series of payments over time. But again, it's not always an insurance company because a defined benefit pension plan is also an annuity. Okay, so I invest $100 uh, and I sign a contract that I, I will, and, and I sign a contract that says I'll receive 110. That's more like debt. Right. That feels like a fixed income, depending on the terms of, of the, the agreement. But what if I invest one hundred dollars and sign a contract that I'm going to receive thirteen dollars a year for the next 10 years? I have a basis of one hundred dollars. How do I recover that basis and recognize income each period as I'm going through? And actually, it's it's pretty easy. Right. So you take the, your basis, divide it by the total amount you expect to receive and then multiply by the amount you did receive. And what you'd find is, oh, I'm getting back $10 a basis and the residual is income to you. Okay, so I invest $100, I sign this contract that says I'm gonna get $13 a year until I die. I have a basis of 100, how do I recover basis and how do I recognize income, right? On this one, it was for 10 years, I knew exactly how long it was gonna take, I knew exactly how many payments I was going to get. But we don't know when we're going to die. And so calculating out, like, what are my payments going to be is much more difficult. So to help us with this, the IRS publishes mortality tables that estimate how many years uh, the table thinks you'll be alive and thus your expected return. And so the tables are published by the IRS. They're based on your age or your beneficiary's age if it's a joint annuity, right? So if you have uh, survivorship benefits. You know, so I buy the annuity, but if I die, I want it to keep paying my spouse, that sort of thing. Pensions use uh, 
Uh, the simplified method, it's based on the same underlying concept we just went through. So uh, first you gotta determine if the pensioner has any basis in the pension. So typically contributions are made by the employer on behalf of an employee um, and they're non-taxable. So that means most contributions are pre-tax, which means you've never been taxed on the income that was contributed into that pension for you. So what it means is you have no basis and any distribution coming out of that pension would be taxable to you. When there is basis, then we need to allocate allocate between basis and income. That's more like those commercial annuities that we just talked about. So the simplified method says add up all of your basis and divide by uh, an expected number of payments based on your age, and that's the exclusion amount. Um, so it's pretty straightforward. Prizes and awards, these are almost always taxable. That includes raffles, lotteries, game shows, awards from employers, like, hey, you were the employee of the month. You know, here's a Amex gift card, whatever it might be. There are three primary exceptions. The first is the Olympic medal exception, or at least that's what I call it. So if the United States Olympic Committee gives you money for participating in the U.S. or uh, on the U.S. Olympic team and your AGI is a million dollars or less, that is all excluded. That is exempt income. There's an exclusion for the Nobel Prize, but you have to meet the requirements. The requirements are you have to give it to a charitable uh, charitable organization. You're not allowed to you know, keep the money. You're not allowed to keep part of the money. You're not required to have to do any services to get the money, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then the last one is the Employee Achievement Award. And so I've, I think I've mentioned already that almost all transfers of value from an employer to an employee are considered taxable income. Well, this is an instance where there's not one. Uh, this is an achievement award. So for example, if you've achieved a certain number of years, service years with your company, like five, 10, 15, you can't give one every year. They, the IRS would frown on that. But uh, if you kind of hit the big milestones, you can give your employee a gift, a tangible property gift. It can't be a cash or a cash equivalent. So it can't be a gift card. Uh, and that can be up to $400. But if you have a written plan, which is, hey, I've got an employee achievement award plan, you can actually increase the limit to $1,600 per year. But that's for any particular individual. On the average, you still have to be uh, no more than $400. All right, a couple other quick hits. Unemployment compensation is taxable. This goes without saying uh, because it, it feels unfair. Like, like I lost my job. I'm getting government you know, benefits. I'm getting a government transfer. Why would that be taxable? You're just having to pay me more to give you some back, but it is taxable. And then Social Security benefits. And I know most of you are too young to even be worried about these, but um, you, know, you turn 65 and a half and you can start collecting Social Security. And uh, it's based on, you know, what you've contributed through employment taxes, your income, your past few years, things like this. But uh, Social Security benefits can be taxed at either zero, 50 or 80 percent. And it depends on uh, your modified adjusted gross income. And that's that's a complicated calculation. I'm never going to make you do it. Uh, well, that's not true. I might make you do it in homework, but I'm never going to make you do it on exam. But it is interesting to see how your Social Security benefits are going to be taxed at one of those three rates. That brings us to the end of Chapter 4.